Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this week's business in 2021 webinar presentation. My name is Kathy Purdy and I'm a marketing manager here at Bond. Just two quick housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter your questions using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to address those as time allows throughout the program. Once the webinar has ended, we would appreciate you taking a moment to complete the brief survey. Your comments and suggestions are important to our panelists and provide us with topics for future presentations. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Andy Bobrock. Thanks, Kathy. Good to be with you. Good to be with everyone else on today's webinar. We've got a, another great group of presenters here with us uh, and uh, another very well attended program. So thank you for that. We appreciate everyone tuning in. As Kathy said, please keep the questions coming. Uh, please keep your suggestions for topics coming. We review these every week. We wanna be timely, we wanna be responsive and we wanna be helpful. So again, we welcome all, all of those issues and questions. Uh, I thought uh, just a, a, a minute uh, before going into our, our panel, I'd talk a little bit again about what's on my desk these days. Uh, so far, uh, it, somewhat similar to my last report, uh, but uh, right now I'm seeing more interest in remote work arrangements and uh, in particular arrangements outside of New York State. Uh, perhaps you've been dealing with this. I think initially this was something that uh, you know, we're just we're dealing with trying to uh, uh, continue to maintain production and operations in different areas. And, and we had staff all over the place potentially. Uh, but now this is being looked at as more uh, long-term type arrangements. And uh, it, while feasible, it raises a number of issues that we're working with clients on. And, and that can include being approved to do business uh, in the particular jurisdiction, and then coverage of the different employment statutes that apply in those jurisdictions, as well as tax withholding obligations. So it's often not uh, just as easy and simple as we may like uh, and as you may expect, in other more highly regulated states like California, for example, there's a wide uh, array of employment laws that you will need to be mindful and considerate of. But we've been working with our clients to find uh, solutions to address these issues and certainly can help to if, if need be. Uh, I'm also starting to see an uptick of uh, training requests from, from clients. Uh, I think we're at that period where we started the uh, anti-harassment training under New York law and, and city law, uh, not that long ago. And uh, so I'm seeing people's annual training requirements come up again, just a reminder. Uh, we do need to do that training on an annual basis. Uh, it's something that uh, is going to continue. Uh, there's certain requirements that need to be met and, and don't let that one fall off your radar screen. This time of the year is also one where I, I do see uh, an uptick in terms of handbook review requests and, and clients looking to update and revise their policies. It seems like every year there's a new batch of laws uh, or different provisions that need to be included in your handbook and 2021 was no exception for New York employers. So now is a good time to dust off that handbook if you haven't, take a look at it and uh, keep in mind there are some new requirements and some new terms that need to be included in your employee handbook. and. Now is just generally a good time of the year to do this uh, and with an idea of rolling it out after the first of the year. Also seeing some, some more union activity in, in different capacities, but also in, in uh, some union organizing um, that's been afoot. Uh, and you know, not surprising, this is something that, that does take place with some regularity uh, here in New York and, and elsewhere, but uh, has caught my attention and, and something I'm, I'm paying close mind to. I think it also raises a, a good issue too on your end uh, for uh, the extent you're union free and want to remain union free, maintaining awareness on the part of your supervisors and staff as to effective strategies to achieve that end, I think is important. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there. We work with a lot of clients on, on that point too, and certainly uh, would be willing to help. And finally, uh, I, you know, again, I'm continuing to see an uptick on claims that are out there. Uh, employment claims, claims with the Division of Human Rights, uh, claims with the Labor Standards Division in New York uh, with respect to payment of wages, salary, or paid time off. Uh, I'm just seeing, seeing more of that. Uh, it seems to come and go in waves, uh, in my experience anyway. So just be aware and, and be ready uh, if those issues should arise. 
So uh, without further ado, so that's on my desk anyway. Uh, hopefully it's interesting uh, and provides some insight to you. Uh, without further ado, I want to I want to turn it over to my good friend uh, and colleague, uh, Mike Billock. Uh, Mike is going to uh, help us sort out what has become uh, an increasingly complex area, and, that, and that's the uh, varying efforts and and seemingly constant changing to vaccine mandates uh, that are out there uh, for New York employers to consider, uh, and what may be ahead too for us. So. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Uh, wh what's going on in this area? Oh, nothing. Back to you, Andy. All right. No. Uh, <laughs> obviously, just kidding. Um, as well as the fact that the, the main reason Andy asked me to join this webinar is so you could see us both in the same place at the same time and realize that, that we are different people. We are different. Yep. Yep. Mike um, is the smarter, more handsome version. <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, all right. So uh, regarding the mandate for healthcare employers, uh, as you know, um, the New York State uh, had issued that uh, that rule that uh, the injunction or excuse me, the uh, the mandate for healthcare employers was going to go into effect uh, in the, the end of September, beginning of October. And that was enjoined uh, in litigation by Judge Hurd, Northern District of, uh, of New York. And that was appealed to the Second Circuit. And on Friday, the Second Circuit uh, dissolved, overturned the injunction so that the Department of Health has the ability to uh, enforce the mandate that is present in that rule um, that states that uh, healthcare workers need to be vaccinated uh, only subject to a medical exemption. And uh, there, in that mandate, there is no exception for a religious exemption. So what does this mean? Uh, you know, has it been determined? Is it, is it settled? Is it done? Uh, and the answer is no, right? So what this was, was a preliminary injunction at the start of a case when uh, somebody sues uh, the, the states to, uh, to overturn a law or a rule. One of the first things that, that can occur is that party can say, well, we don't want this rule to be in effect while we're hashing this out, while we're litigating this issue. So they applied for this preliminary injunction. The injunction was granted temporarily, and the Second Circuit has now uh, dissolved the injunction. The case is still ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. The key here is that the mandate will be in effect while the case is ongoing. Now, uh, we, uh, I checked uh, even just before we logged on here, has there been any additional guidance from New York State Department of Health? Uh, and, uh, and thus far, there isn't any. I, I assume, uh, I know what they say about when you assume, but I assume at some point we will get something from New York State Department of Health to say, okay, in anticipation uh, or really in consideration for the fact that um, this has now been dissolved, we will start enforcing this mandate on X date. I mean, they have the power to do it today. Uh, we don't necessarily anticipate they're going to start doing it today, but we would anticipate that they would give uh, employers and healthcare employers some notice before they start enforcing this mandate that they now have the power to do. So uh, in terms of what do you do in the meantime, uh, that is something that uh, Teresa and Andy are, are going to talk about. I'm really talking more about the status of this case. Uh, one question, of course, is, all right, this, the, uh, the Second Circuit said we are going to overturn this injunction. Is there any possibility the Supreme Court could reinstate it? And the answer really is no. Uh, and the reason that we know this is because also on Friday, big, big news day for vaccine mandates, the, uh, the Supreme Court declined to take up a particular case. And what this case was, was uh, there's a law in Maine that is very similar to the law in New York in terms of vaccination mandate for healthcare employers that did not have a uh, religious exemption. And that law uh, was challenged in court for a preliminary injunction. Uh, in Maine, uh, contrary to, uh, to New York, the law was not enjoined in the, at the district court level. It was appealed to the First Circuit, which also declined to issue an injunction. And so the parties asked the Supreme Court for an emergency injunction to enjoin the law from going, uh, to a, uh, going into effect in Maine. 
And uh, the Supreme Court declined to take up the case. In a case like that for an, uh, an emergency uh, injunction, uh, the, you have to get four justices to agree to take the case. And they got three. They got Justices uh, Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito. Uh, they dissented from the, from the denial of a preliminary injunction saying they, they would have taken this up. And uh, in a very interesting development, Justices uh, Barrett and Kavanaugh issued a concurrence saying that uh, they are exercising their discretion not to take up this case, but that their discretion in, in not agreeing to take this case has no bearing on the merits, that they didn't really want the injunction to be some sort of a test case as to what the Supreme Court would or would not do when it comes to a question of vaccine mandates and whether they must have uh, or uh, you know, must have some sort of religious exemption or religious accommodation. So, which is which is very interesting because normally, when it comes to uh, a preliminary injunction, one of the tests is, do we find this case has merit enough or not? Because you're not going to issue an injunction if you really don't think the the plaintiffs are going to succeed. And what Barrett and Kavanaugh did was say, we are going to deny the injunction and not make any finding. We don't want any. Uh, anybody reading tea leaves regarding this about where we would rule on this. So leaving the door open that they could wind up ruling with uh, Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito in a case on the merits. So, you know, where does this leave us? It leaves us to the effect that this case will, will be, as I mentioned, going forward, we'll, we're going to have cases in New York, Maine, all across the country about these vaccine mandates. They will percolate up through the circuit courts. They will percolate up to the Supreme Court that will probably eventually hear this issue in a year, year and a half, two years. But by that time, uh, the mandates will remain in effect, generally speaking, at least in New York. And will we will we be in a position where you know is the case moot or is this something where um, you know how will the Supreme Court come out on this? By that point, it may be more of an academic exercise because you've already had to deal with these mandates for a year, year and a half, two years. So the the last thing I have to mention here, uh, especially when it comes to vaccine mandates, is uh, we had some news yesterday. Uh, as you know, OSHA, <laughs> beginning of, of September, I believe it was September 9th, was the announcement that OSHA was going to issue that rule. Um, and then uh, OSHA eventually uh, submitted that rule to the, they, they drafted it, submitted it to the Office of Management and Budget. Normally that process only takes a week or two. Uh, apparently it took a little bit more than that, but we did get the announcement yesterday that the Office of Management and Budget has finished their review of the OSHA rule. So uh, with that, there's really, other than a, a final review, uh, you know, I's dotting, T's crossed, but you never know uh, how long things take with an agency. It could be released later today, could be released in a day or two. They, they could wind up holding off on this, but I would imagine now that it's been cleared by OMB that it is going to be issued sooner rather than later, likely within the next few days. And, uh, and once that comes out, obviously, we're going to be pouring over this, uh, as anybody's seen. And, and uh, I believe I've spoken to this on, on one of these webinars to the, to the effect that uh, this, uh, speaking of injunctions, <laughs> this is going to be challenged as soon as it comes out. Um, it, it's going to be challenged. And um, I would say I'd shave, shave my head if it's uh, not enjoined, but obviously that's uh, that's not putting much there on the table. But I would be absolutely shocked if uh, if the rule is not temporarily enjoined uh, when it comes out. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Andy. All right, Mike. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think the the question is right. What what happens first? We're able to finish reading the reg, or it's enjoined. Uh, it, it, it may be the latter. Uh, but stay tuned, uh, Mike. If you if you uh, would be willing, we'd love to have you come back and, and talk to us when the rule comes out. Uh, obviously, we're keeping our ear to the rail closely on that. And if you have any questions of the sort or anything else, Mike's a great resource. So please feel, the, feel, feel free to reach out to him on these. All righty, uh, as, as Mike talked about uh, and, and made a nice segue, uh, Teresa Rusnak is back here uh, to join us this week. Teresa is a regular contributor on our Tuesday webinar. Teresa gave what I thought, and I know others did uh, too, was a, was a very helpful overview of some of the new guidance that the EEOC had, had pushed out 
with respect to uh, religious-based reasonable accommodations and vaccine requirements or mandates. Uh, today, Teresa wanted to go through some of that in a little bit more detail and, and uh, to take a bit of a more practical approach on this. So, Teresa, thanks for joining us. Good to have you with us today. Thank you, Andy, and hello, everyone. As Andy said, I'm going to be talking about the EEOC guidance a little bit, but uh, mostly about practical ways to implement religious accommodations in your workplaces. So if I could have the next slide, please. Yeah, we might we might be having a, a bit of a technical issue there, Teresa. I think Kathy's oh. working on it. Okay. Um, well, I'll just start by saying what was on my first slide, which is that the- Ah, EEOC there we go. Oh. All right. Uh, you know what, can you, there we go. Okay, so um, as we know, on October 25th, the EEOC released guidance specifically addressing whether employers must grant religious accommodations when a vaccine mandate is imposed. You can find that guidance on the EEOC's website. I'll also drop a link in the chat, unless Andy beats me to it when I finish talking here. Overall, as we know, the guidance says that it's a failure that the failure to provide for religious accommodations is a violation of Title VII. So basically, if you're gonna impose a vaccine mandate or as Andy will talk about, have one imposed on you, you're going to have to allow for religious accommodations or at least consider religious accommodations. And that's really what I mean when I say allow for religious accommodations. Not necessarily that you have to grant the accommodation, but that you have to at least consider it. Um, so that's what's going on under Title VII. On October 28th, so a couple of days after I was talking on this webinar last week, the EEOC released its own internal religious accommodation request form for public use. Um, so if you would like to see what a religious accommodation request form looks like, or if you wanna compare and contrast the EEOC's form for your own, um, that's certainly available on their website as well. And like I said, I'll drop the link in the chat. So um, please be aware that there is a form out there. And, you know, to the extent that you're going to have one, I recommend you look at the EEOC's version. Next slide, please. Generally speaking, with any accommodation, the burden is on the employee to make the request. So you don't have to divinely intuit or otherwise just know that someone may want a religious accommodation. They're the ones that have to ask for the accommodation, be it uh, medical or religious, although in this case, we're talking about religious. However, uh, policy language, because I know everyone that's imposing or having vaccine mandates imposed on them is drafting policies, because I've done a number of those policies. Your policy language should make it clear that employees are able to ask for such accommodations. And be that medical or religious, you know, they should know that they are able to make those, those requests and that you will consider them. You as the employer need to designate who will handle the religious accommodation request, whether that's gonna be human resources, a manager, the employee's direct supervisor, whoever it might be. They need to know not only who to whom to make the request, but who's gonna ultimately make the decisions regarding the request. I can't say this enough, each request needs to be, and I should have said need instead of should, needs to be considered based on individual facts and circumstances. What works for one may not work for all and very likely will not work for all. Um, so please, please keep that in mind when you're doing any kind of accommodation, but especially an accommodation around the vaccine mandate. Next slide, please. If uh, you have a thought that perhaps the religious nature of the belief is not sincere or it's unknown to you, you can ask your employees to explain the religious nature of their belief. Um, employees are, per the EEOC, should not assume that the employer already knows or understands their religious beliefs. So you can certainly ask for an explanation of how their religious belief conflicts with your vaccination requirement to the extent you don't understand it or it's not commonly known. And an employee who fails to cooperate with your reasonable request for verification of the sincerity or religious nature of their belief risks losing any subsequent claim that they were denied an accommodation. So basically, if you have reason to doubt the sincerity of their belief or you don't understand how their belief, even if it is sincere, connects to your COVID-19 vaccination requirement, you are able to request additional information, including verification of that belief. Next, next slide, please. Generally speaking, someone's sincerity in holding a religious belief is a matter of individual credibility. Um, you know, it's difficult to look into somebody's mind and see how sincere they are about a religious belief, but there are some factors which may 
speak to undermining credibility. Um, and some of those are if someone's actions are inconsistent with their professed beliefs, they're saying one thing and doing another, whether that's in the vaccine context or not, whether the accommodation sought is desirable for non-religious reasons. You know, perhaps the person is asserting a religious reason, but you know, because they've told you or maybe told other employees that they want this accommodation for reasons that have nothing to do with religion. Uh, the timing of the request renders it suspect. So if someone requests an accommodation for a non-religious reason and you ask them, is this for a religious reason? And they say no. And then three days later, they say, oh, I need a religious request. That's an example of where timing of the request and, you know, perhaps uh, past experience could render it suspect. And then any other reasons to believe the accommodation is not sought for religious reasons. I certainly have had employers call me and say someone's asking for a religious accommodation, but we don't think they're being sincere because they've been telling all of their coworkers that's just a cover story they're using so they don't have to get the vaccine. So, you know, reasons like that, um, where you may think somebody is not asking for it for a sincerely held religious belief are instances where you can start to question the sincerity and ask for additional verification. Next slide, please. Possible accommodations. It's, uh, you know, not one size fits all. Obviously, there are some different options for people with religious accommodation requests to the extent that they don't impose an undue hardship on the employer. You can do things like remote work or telework. You can reassign the person. You can do weekly testing. I know I've seen that as an option in some private sector non-mandate cases as a type of accommodation. Um, I also believe OSHA is going to have a weekly testing opt out for a vaccine mandate that Mike mentioned. You could do social distancing, increase PPE, unpaid leave, paid leave. I'm sure there's others or a combination of any of the above that you could also think of as potential religious accommodations for people who, for religious reasons, can't or won't get the vaccine. Next slide, please. As a reminder, Title VII does not protect social, political, or economic views or personal preferences. So if an employee is objecting to the vaccination based on social, political, and personal preferences or on other non-religious grounds, um, particularly about the effects of the vaccine, those don't qualify as religious beliefs under Title VII. And if you think your employee is objecting based on one of these beliefs and shrouding it in religion, that could be another reason for asking for additional verification or additional information. Next slide, please. If an employer demonstrates that it's unable to reasonably accommodate someone's religious belief without an undue hardship, then Title VII doesn't require the employer to provide the accommodation. The determination of undue hardship, much like the determination of what accommodation would be reasonable, is very much dependent on individual facts and circumstances. What might cause a company an undue hardship for one employee may not cause it for another. And that's true even in the cases where there is a vaccine mandate imposed by state or federal law. I'm going to let Andy talk about that in a couple of minutes. Next slide. The Supreme Court has said that when it is an undue hardship based on religious reasons, it's a little bit lesser of a standard than it is for medical reasons. So things that you can consider for the undue hardship analysis not only include financial costs or monetary costs, but also the burden on the conduct of the employer's business, the risk of the spread of COVID-19 to other employees or the public. So things like impairing workplace safety, diminished, diminishing efficiency in other jobs, or causing coworkers to carry on the accommodated employee's share of hazardous or burdensome work is entirely possible and appropriate to be considered as part of the undue hardship analysis. Uh, next slide. Um, if there is more than one reasonable accommodation that would resolve the conflict, you can choose the one that works better for you. You don't have to give the accommodation that the person requests. A lot of employees have confusion about this and they think because they've requested an accommodation and it is reasonable that they have to be given that particular accommodation. That is not the case. As long as your chosen accommodation meets their religious beliefs and doesn't cause violation of them, you can choose your accommodation. Um, and then certainly always remember that what works at one point in time for an employee may not work at another point in time. So if it becomes an unto a hardship to the employer later, or if the employee's religious beliefs change, then certainly the obligation to renew and re-examine the accommodation is going to exist. 
And I think that's my last slide. So uh, let me just check. Next slide, Kath. Yep. All right. So we're on to Katie. I think before we go to Katie, I'm going to kick it to Andy to talk about how religious accommodations may work in light of the New York State mandate for healthcare workers that they have to get vaccinated. And as Mike has told us, there is no religious exemption to that. So Andy, over to you. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks for that, that helpful overview too. Uh, we had a number of questions that I think fall in two categories. One that you covered already. Um, we'll certainly make our slides available to attendees here. Uh, and, and the other are questions that really are, are uh, individualized and will depend on your, your own facts and circumstances. And you know, I encourage you to reach out to Teresa. She's a tremendous resource on, on these and other areas, and I'm sure we'd be happy to help you and your organization address those issues. So yes, uh, just, just to follow up on, on Mike's very helpful overview of the uh, vaccine mandate uh, that the State Department of Health put in on an emergency basis that covers certain healthcare employees uh, in, in that uh, recent history that you have under your hat now. And then uh, to dovetail with Teresa's presentation on uh, the, the religious accommodation process. And, and for those of you on this webinar who have employees who are covered by uh, the, the DOH's vaccination mandate. We wanted to try to provide some, some general thoughts here uh, on this issue. It's, it's a, uh, one that we're getting a lot of questions about and one that there's a lot of interest in and understandably quite a bit of confusion at this point. So uh, what I'll try to do here is just set some, some general uh, viewpoints and observations. This shouldn't replace you contacting legal counsel to address these issues. Uh, this is not legal advice that we're conveying through these webinars, and certainly not that I'm going to convey to you here, uh, and should replace you contacting legal counsel, which is which is critically important. But the, the, the way I think one can fairly see uh, how to address this issue um, and to reconcile the fact that the state uh, mandate from the Department of Health for covered healthcare workers does not have an exemption for religious-based uh, 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 beliefs and our concurrent obligations that exist under federal and state law to reasonably accommodate a sincerely held religious belief on the part of an employee, right? How do we, how do we uh, address those two issues uh, simultaneously? Uh, and I think it starts by following the process that, that Teresa uh, outlined for you, uh, that a process where uh, the employee comes to us and raises this issue as a concern and, and, and that they have a sincerely held religious belief on their part that impacts their ability to get the vaccination. I think you, you can appropriate, appropriately probe right, and pressure test uh, if permitted on the extent to which this belief is sincerely held. Again, following those guidelines that Teresa laid out for you, uh, understanding the, the nature right, of, of the belief and how it impacts the ability to uh, obtain or not obtain the vaccination. Again, I think uh, that, that dialogue, we call it the interactive process. You're going to want to document it and go through that and collect that information. Then the third step is to determine whether there's a reasonable accommodation that can be provided. Right? I, 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 we don't necessarily read the New York State mandate for covered healthcare workers to preclude this analysis and to per se preclude a reasonable accommodation from uh, being provided. But, but that's where really the, the, the insight that you're going to want to get from legal counsel comes into play because uh, the, whether or not there's a reasonable accommodation that can be provided and what that reasonable accommodation might be is going to, is going to depend on your individualized facts and circumstances. So what could those reasonable accommodations be? Uh, well, in, in the case of this particular requirement, uh, it, it could be a reassignment to a different vacant position uh, that wouldn't be covered, that the person's qualified. Uh, it, it could be a, a temporary leave of absence uh, that, that would, um, again, be temporary in nature, unpaid, uh, but would, would uh, not necessarily be severance of employment. And I, I think the other point here, too, that's important to reiterate, uh, you could get through that analysis. And, and there's other factors to consider, right? Uh, how difficult, what kind of burden would it place on us in, in not filling a particular position, right, and in, in holding it? 
uh, as vacant, right? Those are some of the factors that will go into the question of what type of accommodation can be provided and would it be unduly burdensome for us to provide that accommodation, right? If at the end of that analysis, you determine that uh, the accommodations that were under consideration would be unduly burdensome, or for example, the, the leave of absence would be of an indefinite nature, uh, then there, 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 there's a process and it can be defensible to move forward with termination of employment. But again, it, we think it's important to follow through with this process to document uh, the manner that you're going through that process uh, and to seek legal counsel throughout. So I hope that's helpful uh, to a certain extent. Again, uh, contact your bond attorney if you need more specific information with respect to how to handle this issue in your healthcare employees. All right, Katie, how are you? You're up. I sure am. Um, so I am ready to ready to go. Our update from Albany. Uh, you know, it's a we're gonna go with different types of updates. I know that the last time you tried to throw Montana onto me. Um, but if we're going for a different type of update, we can look at the weather in Albany. It is actually nice out today. Um, so going forward with what's happening in Albany, um, Cases have over a 14 day period been declining, but you do see that they had a slight bounce up from last week. Um, so over a 14 day period, we've seen cases go down. Um, the percent change has been by 13% uh, over a 14 day period. Um, again, I'm a little concerned about that spike going up, but the difference between the daily average from last week to this week is not huge. It's, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're not talking big numbers here, but uh, still something to keep our eyes on. In terms of vaccination progress, we've seen progress occurring in, in both the fully vaccinated and, uh, and one dose. So fully vaccinated, we have gone up 1% from last week to 67% are fully vaccinated. Uh, no increase in terms of one dose for all New Yorkers. I expect this number is going to be changing a lot dramatically in the next week. Um, and then 12 and older, um, we have 77% are fully vaccinated. That is an increase. And 86% have received one dose. Uh, that also, that number also went up. Um, and so we'll, we'll keep watching what's happening there. But, uh, and what I imagine many of you have questions about today, um, about what's happening with vaccines for children. So today the CDC uh, advisory panel is expected to approve uh, giving the COVID-19 vaccine to children. After that, there will be one more set of approval that it needs to go through, uh, but it looks likely that vaccines for kids five to 11 will be available uh, as of next week. Uh, so the, the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine has been distri distributed. Uh, there are lots of shots being distributed right now to give to kids. They have a different dose. Um, and so lots of places have been scheduling appointments um, if that impacts you. But I wanted to walk through a little bit of what the process looked like here. And NPR did uh, my job for me by putting together this little infographic. Um, so this is how the vaccine became authorized for kids 5 to 11. First, the clinical trial completed as of October 7th. Then um, on October 26th, the FDA advisory panel voted um, to you know, authorize this. Then the full FDA authorized it on October 29th. So now we're at the CDC side of things where they have to authorize it with their advisory panel. And then after the CDC advisory panel, there needs to be a CDC recommendation that comes from the CDC director. Um, it's assume, we are assuming that that will come very quickly after the panel uh, presumably will approve the vaccine. Um, and then it'll be available to the public. Um, it, this article states that it will be as early, available to kids five to 11 as early as of next week. Um, it may be sooner based on you know when the approval occurs and based on uh, the distribution of the vaccine. So it, that will be something to to keep your eyes out for um, because that'll obviously be impacting many of your employees and many of you. Um, and in terms of other vaccine mandates, you know I know we, we went through a lot of the vaccine mandates, but the New York specific ones, 
Looking at what's happening in New York City, uh, all New York City municipal employees were required to have at least one shot by November 1st. Um, the workforce, total municipal city workforce is around 400,000 employees, um, 9,000 of which were placed on unpaid leave yesterday for failing to receive an exemption or get the shot. Uh, that's approximately 2.5% of the workforce. Um, and we will continue to see how that plays out over the next few weeks. Uh, the HERO Act was extended. It was extended to December 15th. Um, I guess we got sick. And I, I think that they recognize that the beginning of December is going to be a little bit tricky in the Department of Health. Um, we will have a new commissioner coming in um, as of December 1st. So that is my assumption as to why they kicked it back to December 15th. Um, it may also be that they are looking at the data and hoping that by the time we get to December 15th, we will be below the substantial or high thresholds um, as designated by the CDC so that they can uh, remove this designation. It does apply. I saw a question in there about masks. Um, you know, masks are required under the HERO Act, irrespective of uh, vaccine status. So if you have other questions about that, please feel free to reach out to us and ask. Um, okay, so there was an expansion to New York paid leave. Um, this was signed by the governor yesterday. Big thing to know here is that this does not go into effect until 2023. So January 1st, 2023 is when this goes into effect. But what is this expansion to New York paid family leave? It adds siblings to the definition of a family member for paid family leave. So that includes biological adopted half sibling or step siblings. Um, so that is pretty straightforward in terms of uh, what's happening there. Again, this is not until 2023. So it does not apply now. Um, we have a lot of lead time up to it. Um, and I'm sure that any of our labor and employment attorneys will be happy to answer those questions about that whenever you have them. Um, finally, it is election day today. Um, I figured that there would be some questions about what's happening in New York, because when you go to, uh, to vote, there are five ballot propositions, which is uh, somewhat unusual. In New York State, we generally don't have ballot propositions out west. Uh, ballot propositions are a very common thing, but in New York, it is uh, required for certain constitutional changes. And so what are the five ballot propositions that are going to be on your ballots today? Um, the first one is a change in the redistricting process. Uh, the first thing that it would do is cap the number of state senators to 63. That is, uh, the sponsors argue that that is required so that we avoid weird redistricting from occurring. Um, once you have a cap level, you can't just add districts willy nilly. Um, additionally, it would require all New Yorkers to be counted in the redistricting pro process, regardless of your uh, their citizen status. So what does that mean, especially in you know a place like New York City? It means that people who are not citizens would count as people in terms of who that elected official will be representing in that district. Um, so that would be a change in New York. Um, additionally, it would count incarcerated people at the place of their last residence in terms of where you count them for voting uh, for the district and not at the place where they are detained. Um, so that is that would be a shift. So that's ballot proposal number one. Ballot proposal number two is a constitutional right to clean air, water, uh, and a healthful environment. Uh, number three would have would allow for same day voter registration. Uh, New York is uh, pretty far behind in a lot of respects on voting rights. This has become an extremely popular thing. Um, so that's that's also on the ballot. Uh, additionally, no excuse absentee ballots. Think back to last year, the governor, the former governor, Andrew Cuomo, issued an executive order allowing for people when voting in the primaries and in the general election last year to receive a no excuse absentee ballot, um, basically saying that uh, COVID counted as a reason enough to receive an absentee ballot. Um, that is not the case anymore. You'd still need to have a reason in New York to receive an absentee ballot. This ballot proposal, if enacted, would remove that uh, hindrance. 
Finally, there is a ballot proposal focused on New York City. It would change the New York City civil courts. It would double the monetary limit filed for claims uh, from 25,000 to 50,000. The reason for this is uh, something that many of you uh, who are dealing with any litigation matters likely know. Uh, courts are very backed up in New York State right now and everywhere, but New York City Supreme Courts, which are the lowest level courts in New York, uh, New York City, that they need help. Uh, and the way that they can get help is by shifting some of that workload over to the New York City civil courts. That is what the sponsors say as to why this is needed. So that is our run through of what the ballot propositions are. Um, I hope everybody goes and votes today. It's a always have a lot of fun going and voting. So with that, Andy, I am done. Wow. All right, Katie, you covered a lot there. Um, I should add that uh, Katie has um, been tasked with appearing before the state assembly and, and testifying uh, coming up here. Uh, we're, you know, very um, appreciative and proud of her for, for doing that. And uh, I've given her my list of grievances already and, and that I expected to present. So far, she's been resistant to this idea of, of speaking on my behalf there, but Katie, should I should I have people email you their concerns directly so you can convey them, or how do we go I about? Mean, if you if you want to, they will not come up. I would love to be able to keep my job. Um, so, oh, okay, All right. <laughs> believe you be, believe you be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, All sorry, right, hey, thanks session, every... Separate hearing for that. Oh, okay. All right, next hearing. Next yeah. hearing. All right. Hey, thanks to our presenters who did a great job. Their contact information is here. If you have any questions or concerns, reach out to them directly. Thanks for being with us this week. We'll see you again next week. Be well and be safe in the meantime. Thanks.